in the entirety of American history, there have been but two black women elected to the United States Senate. Illinois Senator Carol Mosley Braun, then California Senator Kamala Harris, now doing triple representation duty as the first woman, first black, and first Asian American vice president. There is a good chance that that will change in 2024. Today, Delaware Senator Tom Carper announced his retirement, and in so doing, he endorsed the state's lone congressional representative, Lisa Brunt Blunt Rochester. If she runs and wins, she would be just the third black female senator in U.S. history. Carper is the fourth Democratic senator to announce their retirement, a list that includes California Senator Dianne Feinstein. California Congresswoman Barbara Lee is running against her congressional colleagues, Representatives Katie Porter and Adam Schiff, to succeed her. Black women are central to the Democratic Party base and a key to their electoral success. But when it comes to representation in public office, this country is still mostly a white boys club and not easy to break into. Take, for example, former North Carolina Supreme Court Justice Sherry Beasley, who ran four successful statewide races. But when it came to her Senate race, she came up short, losing to Trump-backed right-winger Ted Budd. This morning, she told NPR why the race was such a challenge. The perception is always that the U.S. senator is a white man. That is the presumption, and then we work from there. I'm joined now by someone familiar with the challenges of running competitive statewide races in purple states, Stacey Abrams, a 2022 Georgia Democratic gubernatorial candidate and former Georgia House minority leader. Abrams has a brand new thriller out tomorrow called Rogue Justice, which follows a Supreme Court law clerk as she unpacks a riveting legal mystery. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. I am excited and cannot wait to make that a summer read for myself. But I do want to first quickly ask you about this, because you face this challenge, um, Stacey, that you know, for black women, the perception is in this role, we think you're fine and we will vote for you. But then when you go to a statewide race, there literally have not been any black women governors and just a handful of black women senators. Why do you suppose that disconnect is there when black women are literally the key base for the Democratic Party? Well, I think it's broader than just a Democratic issue. It's an American conversation that we need to have. Black women are seen as useful and necessary in propping up and supporting most of the facets of American society, but we are rarely seen as capable of actually leading. And part of our responsibility, both as Democrats, but more broadly as Americans, is to widen our aperture and to understand that black women can lead. But just as every other community got into that position of leadership through support and endorsement and engagement, the same must be true and must be availed and made available to black women. And that just hasn't happened at the scale that we need with the speed that we need. But I also remind us that it's a very recent reality that we've had black women mayors at, in major cities. Mm -hmm. And so we have we started out so far behind that we are starting to catch up. But that also means that there has to be patience on the part of voters that we're going to have to keep doing this. You're going to keep seeing names and faces because we have got to break through this notion that black women cannot hold these executive jobs, cannot hold these statewide jobs. It is entirely possible. And more importantly, it is necessary because the needs that we have in this nation, the challenges that we face, black women are often the harbingers of the most harsh realities that we face, but we're also the innovators for solving and navigating those issues. And so while Democrats have, I think, the lead to take, because, yes, indeed, black women are the most reliable voters for the Democratic Party, it is important that we make certain that this is not just a black women's issue. This is an American issue. This isn't just about yeah. Democrats. It's about Democrats, Republicans, independents. Any person who wants their nation to be better should look to black women and help them succeed. But at the same time, for, I think, specifically, uh, you know, because the Democratic Party is the diverse party, the Republican Party is 90 percent white. Let's just, you know, be honest about it. The Democrats then are all the other people, right? So uh, you, do, you, do you kind of feel a bit Gavin Newsom's pain here? He promised on this very show that he would appoint a black woman if, in fact, an opening came, comes up. Dianne Feinstein is now hanging on to that seat, even though she said she's going to retire in January. And now you have three parts of the Democratic base all competing. You have Adam Schiff, who was brilliant in the impeachment impeachment trials. You have Katie Porter, who progressives and young folks in California really love. And then you have Barbara Lee, who's beloved among African-Americans, but far behind in distant third place. They're now all competing. And Gavin Newsom isn't in a position to make that choice. But if it did open up, how would he even make it? 
Well, I, I want to acknowledge that I've endorsed Barbara Lee because I know her work. I know that while she is certainly a representative of the black community, she has also been just a stalwart for progressive issues for more than 35 years. And so let's be clear that she is capable of doing this job for all of those communities. But I think yeah. that what the governor is going to face, what voters are going to have to face, we have to create the reality we want to see. And we can't say we want this to be true, but we won't do the work to make it so. And I believe that if we want a truly representative society, if we want diversity to be more than a tagline, we've got to do the work that sometimes means we have to not vote for our friends or we have to vote for one friend over the other in order to make yeah. representation real. So now let's talk about the book. Okay, so you you are a New York Times best-selling fiction author, Rogue Justice. Now this book comes out May twenty third. Um, let me read uh, the the synopsis. Another complex, high stakes Washington legal thriller featuring the return of the fiercely intelligent and tough as nails Avery Keene. Tell me about Avery Keene. Tell me about this book. Avery Keene is a Supreme Court clerk who made her first appearance in While Justice Sleeps. You don't have to have read While Justice Sleeps to to read Rogue Justice. But she was so compelling in the first book, she got another story. She is a Supreme Court clerk who in, finds herself facing a blackmail threat to the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Service Court, I mean, surveillance court. Most people don't know anything about it because their, their opinions aren't public. But what if that court, which is responsible for national security, was under threat itself? And she's got to unravel the mystery and try to save our lives with no one being the wiser while she also watches the president undergo an impeachment trial. So she's got a few political things she's got to navigate as well. I, I, I almost want to ask, is there a Clarence Thomas who's got a rich friend who purchases his mother's house? But I don't want you to spoil it for folks if there is a character in there. But is, I, I, I mean, there's so much Supreme Court drama. <laughs> I will say this. It, my focus is to take and demystify Washington, but to also look at questions and conversations we don't really have. Uh, the conversation about AI is a critical and pertinent one. But we've got to deal yeah. with cyber threats that are immediate. We have to deal with a vulnerable power grid. I, I'm proud to be working with an organization that's helping electrify everything. But I also yeah. wrote a book that looks at how vulnerable our power grid is and issues within our own courts, looking at the Ferris Doctrine yeah. and how it treats our military. And so this is a very complex but fun book. It's easy read, lots of fun. And Avery Keene is someone you want to take along with you on vacation. Yeah, but let me tell you, the reviews have been outstanding. Just praise, 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 praise. I cannot wait to read it. Stacey Abrams, congratulations, New York Times, best-selling author um, and also very smart person uh, on politics and everything else. Stacey Abrams, thank you very much. Congratulations.